<clears throat> we're going to be in Daniel chapter 11 today. I'm not going to have you stand and read it. There's 45 verses in 11. I'm not going to have you have you stand all the way for it. But we're going to we're going to uh, to go through Daniel chapter 11. I believe the the children are going back. See, and as they're going back, I want you to see something. Miss Vivian, can you stop for a second? Can you can you hold up what's in your hands there? Hold it up high so everybody can see it. She got a stack of Bibles, so. They're not going back there just to have a good time. They're going back there. They're going to be learning some scripture. We've got people going to be teaching them some stuff. So we need to thank God for that. All right. So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 11. And I want to, I want to say this because we're getting close to wrapping up our study in Daniel chapter 11. You can, you can probably, in Daniel, chap, in Daniel period, you can probably tell that because we're, you know, after chapter 11, there's only one chapter left. So. You might be able to deduce down there that, hey, we're getting pretty close to, uh, to wrapping up this study and we'll move on. The idea of the, of the church here and, and what, what's going on isn't, isn't to sit here and camp out in Daniel for, for the rest of our lives. Because I'm going to tell you what, there's plenty in Daniel right now that we could camp out in until the Lord comes home. There's plenty. We, we needn't we need go no further. But we're going we're gonna to do that. We're going to do that because we're, because we're in the church age and we want to know what the Bible has specifically to say for the church age. But right now, as we, we close up Daniel, I want you to, to remember a few things. I want, you to, I want you to take from this lesson a few reasons here that, that this book is such a highly despised book. I hope that you can accept the fact that Bible prophecy is Bible history that may or may not have taken place yet. If the Word of God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. You can take it to the bank. You can write it down. It's as good as done. Nothing's going to stop what God's preordained. Nothing. Amen. Something else to understand is, is if you, uh, it's okay if you don't understand everything that's in Scripture. I can assure you as I stand here today, I do not understand everything that's in, that's in Scripture. I didn't, I didn't take that, uh, you know, that, that uh, New Age seminary class where you get to know everything before you come out. You know, they, they're, there's still things to learn here. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming in most cases that my God must be a little bit bigger than some other people's God because there's some people that believe they know everything. If a man tells you he's a Bible expert... Flee from that man. Amen. Flee from him. Please flee from him. But if you don't understand Scripture completely, it's okay. The guys that were, the guys that were uh, speaking as the Holy Spirit inspired them to speak here, they didn't understand most of the time what they were saying. They were just saying what they were told to say. If we were meant to understand everything, there wouldn't be the command for us to study. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not only does God command us to study His word, but He also commands us to flee from fools and con men who teach things that are contrary to His word. This includes those that teach that the book of Daniel is Jewish folklore. 2 Timothy 2.16 But shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness. Let me tell you right now, man says, well, I'm a Bible expert. You better flee from him, shun him, and flee from him. That's about as vain as something can be, saying that they're an expert on the things of God. Concerning those men and women who will try to diminish the Word of God, I, I pray that you'll be obedient to mark them, and dismiss them from your company. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, this is talking to saved folks here. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offensive contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Let me stop and let me explain something to you here. This doesn't say mark them that, that cause divisions. It says mark them that cause divisions and offensive contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to cause divisions because I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to preach this Word of God. It's going to divide people. 
I can assure you that's what the Word of God does. But the group you're supposed to mark, and I, I'm going to tell you, the, the, the lost con men out there, they want, to, they want to mark me as someone causing division. By all means, go ahead, go ahead and mark me. Go do whatever you think you've got to do here. But you disobey in Scripture because it says to mark them that cause divisions and offensive contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. If they're preaching good doctrine, there's no need to mark them. It goes on and says, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. As we get into Daniel chapter 11, you're going to quickly see how this chapter contains some of the most specific prophecy in Scripture. It's no wonder that the, the liberals want you to believe that it was written after the events took place. They can't have you walking around believing that an all-knowing God knew what to write in His book before it happened. They, they'll do whatever they can and they'll say whatever they can say to take away from the divine natures of God. But let's look at what God says about Himself here. Psalms chapter 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. I'm pretty sure that includes uh, what would happen after Daniel would live. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. I'm pretty sure that includes what would happen after Daniel would give this prophecy. He knew what would happen there. Isaiah 40 and 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of His understanding. I mean, not only... Does he understand what he understands, but he understands more than you realize he understands because he's that big of a God. Whenever you try to paint him into a box, guess what? He's that big of a God. He doesn't fit into the box that you want to paint him into. That goes for us in this room. That goes for them by social media. That goes for, that goes for the liberal theologian. That goes for absolutely everybody. And guess what? You start getting into theological liberalism as soon as you start trying to paint God inside of a box. Who were you and where were you when God was hanging to earth on nothing? Now you figure out how God can hang the world on nothing. Then you can start figuring out uh, if you want to paint Him in a box or not. That same God that knows the number of hairs on every one of our naughty heads is the same God who knows what's going to happen with His creation. Now you can believe it or you can reject it. No matter which you choose, it will not have any effect on the truth. Isaiah 46 and 10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's the God that told Daniel what to write down. The one that could declare the, the end from the beginning. Now, chapter 11, it's not a feel-good story. There's a lot of bad news in chapter 11. I mean, I, a ton of it. And there's no way to sugarcoat it. It's God's will for you to believe His Word, not for you to, to feel good because you heard it. If you need something to make you feel good, go buy yourself something that you don't really need. Right? You'll, you'll feel good. Yesterday, TJ put some uh, sand in his grandbaby's... Uh, Sandbox. It made you feel good, didn't it? It made me feel good to hear about it. Hey, buy yourself something if you need to feel good. Felt better getting cowboy boots. I know that's right. So you can kick that sand out. If buying something don't make you feel good, go eat something you ain't supposed to have. You'll feel good for a minute. And then you'll stop feeling good. Go do a good deed if you need to feel good. Go, go do something like that. Go, go, be, go be kind to a stranger. Go feed the homeless. Go feed a widow some orphans. Go do that if you need to feel good. Don't come to the Word of God thinking it's supposed to make you feel good. I'm going to tell you what, if you're reading that Word of God and you're studying that Word of God, man, you're going to feel like garbage. Last night I started reading in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. I read, read all the way through 1 Corinthians last night. I just decided, just, hey, let's, let's start right here for some reason. By the time I got done reading 1 Corinthians, 
my, my, my phone, I was doing it on my phone, which is a little unusual for me, but I was doing it so I could screenshot things that I didn't remember reading before. And I'm gonna tell you what, I went back, I thumbed through how many screenshots I had, and I, I felt like a jerk. I felt like, my goodness, I, I felt bad for that reason. I felt like, hey, maybe I haven't been studying good enough, maybe I haven't been studying hard enough. But I'm also thankful for that, because I'd hate to read through God's Word and something not jump out at me that I didn't, uh, didn't catch before. That, that'd, be a, that'd be a shame for that to happen. I, I, was, I was thankful for it, and I was saddened by it at the same time. And I, I, I'm going I'm to tell you now, the, it just to be able to glean from Scripture, even when you've, you've gone and you've read it so many times and you quoted verses so many times. I'm talking about verses jumping out at me that were right beside verses that I've had memorized that I'm like, well, Lord, why didn't I know that was there? I, I'm, I'm going to tell you now. Hey, you know, it, feel, it feels good to, to study that Word sometimes, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes you're going to walk away from it feeling worse than when you walked into it. It's just, it's how it's designed. It's not designed to make you feel good every time you come to it. A church service is not designed as well if it's going to be, follow Scripture to make you feel good every time you come in the door. If I make you feel good every time you come in, please go find another preacher because I'd be failing at my job. I would wager that probably about 70 to 80 percent of the Bible is actually negative, but you need to hear it. You need to hear it because, my goodness, that 20 percent, that maybe 25 percent, maybe even less than that, the, the good news of the gospel, that negative is what makes the good news so dang on good. I'm telling you, if you, don't, if you don't take nothing else from that, take, take that from it. You're not always going to feel good after you read Scripture. You're not always going to feel good after you've heard somebody preach a message. Now, let's look here at the, the prophetic history that's given to us in Daniel 11. I, I say all that because this is not a, anywhere, nowhere near a feel-good message. First off, we're gonna look, this is a history lesson. Some has happened, some hasn't happened. It's still a history lesson. First off, we're going to look in Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at these four Persian kings here. Also, I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Now, this passage in Daniel is, is pretty simple. When you're dealing with history, it's simple. You're not dealing with, with things getting messed up. You're not dealing with things that could possibly be confusing. You're dealing with history. Daniel's learning that there's going to be four kings that follow Darius the Mede. Now, for Daniel, this was future events that were going to take place. For us, it's history. He's learning there's going to be four kings, and the fourth king will be far richer than the previous three. I mean, the Word of God simple. Now, the titles to these first three kings, they're given to us in Ezra chapter 4. So if you make notes in your Bible and you want to study this out, because I'm going to tell you now, we're getting close to the end here. If you want to study this out, you want to go to Ezra chapter 4 for it. And if you'll look in verses 6, verses 7 and 8, and verses 24, you can get the titles of these kings right there. I'll give them to you now. I'm going to butcher the saying of them, but it sounds like dinosaur names, honest to goodness, when you, when you read them. Ahasuerus... Artaxerxes and Darius, this one's easy, king of, of Persia. This is not to be confused with Darius the Mede. This is a different Darius. This is Darius king of Persia. The Darius the Mede was the Median king. So we've got their names there. And, oh, they got, excuse me, we have their titles. I've said it before. These are the titles that are given in Ezra 4, not the actual names. Now, Clarence Larkin, if you want to, if you want to study in his book of Daniel, a good, he gives the names inside of his uh, inside of his books. I can't find where he's wrong about it. I believe he's, I believe he's right on it here. He gives the names of these uh, of these first three kings. Well, he gives all four of them, but the first three are are Cambyses, Suedo Smyrtus, and Darius Histopus. I told you these were dinosaur names. They're hard to pronounce, but the, these are the kings. If you want to study, this was. This was prophecy for Daniel, history for us. We can go back and we can look and see which kings they were talking about. After these three kings, there would be a fourth one that would, uh, that would raise up. He would, be, uh, he would be much richer than the rest of them. And his name was Antiochus, I believe was his name here. 
Then we're going to skip here to, to well, we're not skipping, we're going to move right on to verses 3 and 4, and we're going to talk about a mighty king of Greece. This is not that fourth king. This is after that fourth king. You've got, you got to pay close attention to how things are worded here. Verse 3, And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So between verses 2 and 3, we've got a gap of about 165 years that's taking place here. It's obvious this is after the life of Daniel at this point. If you haven't gathered it through where we're already at, this is, this is completely obvious. We are well past this. We're well past the life of Daniel here, but Daniel's still the one reporting it to us. This great Greece, king of Greece is Alexander the Great. We've already referred to him, I believe, back in, um, in chapter 8. Verses 3 and 4 are a further description of the great horn of the rough he-goat that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. And Daniel 8 and 8, it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. If you'll notice here in verse 4 of Daniel chapter 11, we're talking about the four winds, we're talking about the kingdom being divided. Daniel chapter 8, verses 21 through 22, and says, And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that, now, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, for four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Now, we're about to get in here to... Um, to verses uh, 5 through 20. We've got, we've got a good deal of Scripture here that's going to cover these next set of kings. And as I said, this is history. This isn't, this isn't going to be a feel-good message. This is something you need to build upon because of things that are getting ready to quickly come to pass. Christian, you're in here today. I'm going to tell you, this verse right here, you may not, you, this passage, you may not glean a whole lot from it today. But hopefully there will be somebody watching by way of social media that may not glean as well today, but hopefully this thing will be preserved out for somebody that doesn't, uh, doesn't get uh, drowned up in, in strong delusion here because this is talking about some end time stuff that we're getting to. This is going to be talking about the, the Antichrist for us here. When we're looking for application for the church age, if you're in here today and you're like, well, I need, I need to know something. What, what can I have for today? Here's what you can take from it from today. You can trust in the Lord. You can trust in that God that gave this word to Daniel before it happened, so long before it happened. We've got, we've got testament here of just a few years before it would happen. Then we've got testament of almost 200 years before it would happen. And then we've got testament for at least 2,000 years before something would happen here. Many of these events have taken place, but there's still a few things that haven't taken place. And for us to be able to, to look back on the events that have taken place, that were future events when they were written, we can also trust that the future events that have yet to be f fulfilled are Bible prophecy. And I tell you again, it is Bible history that has not taken place yet. So let's look here at verses 5 through 20 at this these kings of uh, Syria and Egypt. They're called the kings of the north and the south here. And we're going to start off looking at their alliance. Now this is, this is history that's taking place. And the king of the, of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he, sh uh, and one of his princes, and he shall be... Uh, let me start over. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion in his dominion. Shall, his dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of the years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But he shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these times. So here we have an alliance being secured between Syria and Egypt, and it's based off the 
the daughter of the king of Egypt being given to marriage to the king of Syria. Now, they got plenty of family problems here. So we're about to, we're about to have some, some issues here. The, next, we're going to look at the defeat of Syria by Egypt. But chapter, Verse 7, But out of a branch of a root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt, into Egypt their gods, which their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces and one shall certainly come and overthrow and pass through and shall, re and shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him and the king of the north and he shall set forth a great multitude but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude... His heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. After the Egyptians defeat the Syrians, the Egyptian king is going to take Syria's treasures, and he's going he's to take them back to Egypt. So, you know, they've just had a marriage. This thing didn't work out very well. And I'm going to tell you now, when you start dealing with people from different cultures, and pay close attention to what I'm saying here. I'm not talking about different races here. I'm talking about different cultures. When you start dealing and marrying into different cultures and even going into business with different cultures, you will find yourself in problems. Almost every time, if not every time, that it happens in Scripture when someone marries into a different culture. I'm talking about marrying people that look the same. Sometimes what looks the same is not always the same. Sometimes if it says it's the same, it's not always the same. And things that aren't the same are different. You, know, think, you need to think about that. Things that aren't the same are different. That includes the Bible itself. That includes... I wasn't planning on, uh, on putting a plug in for the King James there, but... But when you, take in the, when you compare two different copies of, of supposed Scripture and they don't say the same thing, guess what? They're not the same thing. And when you marry into a different culture, sometimes it's so she can get close to you. And sometimes, it, sometimes that's going to be bad for you in the event. And it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Sometimes in different cultures, uh, women still cling to what daddy at home says instead of, instead of clinging to, to their husband. Sometimes it just happens. It happens that way. And some cultures, uh, men are, put, are given more preference than, than women. Some cultures, mom is given more preference than the wife. You, hey, you better, be, you better be careful. Ladies, you marry into the wrong culture. You might be, you might be uh, third in line. It might be second to God, then his mama, and then, then you. You better be careful. I'll tell you another good example, and I'll move on. Fellas, you better be careful, especially marrying single mamas. Ain't nothing wrong with a single mama, but I'm going to tell you what. If she's going to put that kid before her husband, you better not marry that girl. You better not do it. You have an unhappy marriage. Let's look here now at the, the defeat of Egypt by Syria before I go off and be all political. For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of the south shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced city. And the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will with... with according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Now, here we are. We have Syria coming back and conquering Egypt, even though Egypt is heavily fortified. We've got to keep in mind, and this, this is something for the church age that we can glean out of this thing, we've got to keep in mind that it's God who sets up kingdoms and kings and takes down kingdoms and kings at His pleasure. 
These events were given to the Jews as a sign that they might believe here. The point of us, uh, uh, the point of telling us that Egypt was heavily fortified here is to remind us that nothing can stop what God has preordained. It wouldn't matter if they'd have built fences twice as tall, three times as thick. They were going to be overthrown here. And the, the funny thing about it is they would have had a copy of, they would have had a copy of this to know what was going to happen, to know the future. They would have known that they needed to fortify that city. And I bet you that's why it was so fortified. I bet you somebody said, well, they're coming after us. We better fortify this thing. And they couldn't even do a good enough job knowing what was going to happen. Then they come to a little bit of a stalemate here. Verse 17. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many, but a prince of his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So here we have the Syrian king, He's given his daughter in marriage to the Egyptian king. She sets out to destroy the Egyptians from inside. Verse 19, Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, and he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a, a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger, anger nor in battle. Now, I do wish that when somebody tried to raise taxes here, we'd, they would only stand for a few days and be destroyed. That's not the case. They, they get second and third and, and ten terms here. But here, <laughs> we can even see, even, 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 even the Word of God, we can see that raising of taxes wasn't a good idea. Let's go on to this evil Syrian king. Now, this evil Syrian king was... a. Uh, was uh, Antiochus Ephenus the fourth? He came into power about 175 BC. Verse twenty-one. We're going to talk about his uh, his craftiness here. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and attain the kingdom by flatteries. And with him the arms of a, of a flood shall they be overflown from him before him, and shall be broken. Yea, also the princes of the covenant. And after the league made, he, made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall bring, be, become strong with a small people. Now this king is a type of the Antichrist. We have had plenty of types of the Antichrist throughout history. To, to name a couple, we've got, uh, we've got um, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm getting there. Nebuchadnezzar, um, Belshazzar, Antiochus, Adolf Hitler, Barack Obama. It's a type of the Antichrist. And we're going to get to that. That offends somebody. I don't care. Turn it off. Report it on Facebook. Could care less. We're going to get to it. We're going to look at how he's a type of the Antichrist. At this very moment, could he be? I don't know. Maybe. I'm kind of, I kind of got my suspicions on this guy. I've been watching this joker. We'll get to that, though. Did I, did I read verses 21? I think I did. No. Yeah, I did. All right, so we're getting here. We're talking about the... The evil king, he's a type of Antichrist. He's able to secure his position by flattery. That means telling people what they want to hear. All right? Verse 24, let's look at his conquests and his confrontations. They'll be covered here between verses 24 and 30. He shall enter peaceably even upon the, the fastest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and the riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. He's going to have issues with Egypt here. And he shall stir up his, 
stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both of these kings, the king's heart shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of, of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now let's, let's look at his cruelty here. Now we're still talking historically here about uh, the... I gave you the name, I butchered it, the, uh, the Antiochus uh, Ephnes. We're still talking about him. But there's types, and he's a type and shadow of the true Antichrist. Let's look at his, uh, his cruelty here. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination to make desolate. And, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by the flame, by captivities and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some, of, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Now, in verses 31 through 35, we have an evil king who's taken it upon himself to desecrate the Jewish temple and to even kill Jews because of his hatred for them. All right? So we've definitely got a, a type of the Antichrist here. Now we're getting into a satanic, self-willed king in this next passage here, and it's going to describe the evil reign of the coming Antichrist. So far we've been talking about two kings going back and forth. Now we're going to start, you're going to see the Bible change its verbiage, and this is why you've got to hang on every word. Now you go from talking about two kings to the king or the Antichrist. Daniel eleven thirty six 36 through 45, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. All. All right. So we're talking about the we're talking about the the soon coming Antichrist. If he's not already here, we're talking about the Antichrist. We're talking about somebody that's going to blaspheme God in multiple ways. Here, we're also talking about somebody who most likely right now is worshiping a different God. Anyway, this is why I do believe Barack Obama is a perfect picture of it. Barack Obama, he he is a Muslim. He is worshiping a false god, Allah. He'll even blaspheme that one, I do believe, if it's him. I'm not saying it's him. I'm saying that we'll let the cards lie. Where they, I'm happy to be wrong about it, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm happy to be right about this one. Because if he's, if he's him, that means the church is going to be out of here soon. I'll see you all on the other side. Amen. That's it. We'll, 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 be, we'll be good to go if you're, if you're believing. So in a way, I hope it's Him, and for His sake, I hope it's not Him. I hope, I hope the man comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior ultimately. But my goodness, would I love to go on and go be with, be with the Lord. He'll blaspheme God in unheard of ways. I do believe based off of verse 37 here, I'm going to read it again. Neither shall he regard the gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. I do believe that that verse 37 is clear that the Antichrist will be some type of smooth-talking, mixed-raced, queer, Syrian Jew. 
I believe that is clear, and that is why number one on my, my number one contender right now is Barack Obama. If y'all live to see that man get appointed to, to lead the UN, I hope you got your, your affairs in order. I doubt, we, I doubt we live to see it. I hope, I hope we're out of here by then. But if we do live to see it, I'm, be ready. And again, I'm not preaching that as, I'm not saying that as Bible here. I can be wrong about that. I can't be wrong about what Scripture says is going to happen, but I can be wrong about who I think is going to be. And plenty of people have been wrong before. I've been, I've been, been, wrong, about, I've been wrong about stuff this morning. Great day. I was wrong thinking that the whole drum set would fit in the back of the truck. It, it wasn't back of the van. It didn't fit back there. I, I can be wrong about stuff. I'm telling you. But I don't think I am. I just watched a live event take place the other day. It happened on the 15th. Of all places I watched it, I watched it on TikTok. I saw a, a live event of something taking place. The Jews are getting ready to start sacrificing red heifers. All right? The Jews haven't been sacrificing anything for about uh, uh, close to 2,000 years now, since about 70 AD. There hasn't been a red heifer in Israel for 2,000 years. And on the 15th and on the 16th, because I watch it. And you can, go, you can go look this up now. I mean, it's live because they're going to quarantine these animals for, for two weeks. But they're, they're videoing it. I was watching this, this rabbi was speaking. And then all of a sudden, they, they, nobody cared what the rabbi had to say anymore. Now they were filming these cows. And even the rabbi, he, he tur turned from the podium. He run over there to go watch them cows getting there to, uh, getting there to Israel. First time in 2,000 years. These things are going to be bred to sacrifice. We're getting close. I mean, when that sacrifice, those, those might be the very cows that are, that are there to be sacrificed for the Antichrist to come in and put a stop to it. This could be it. I'm telling you, you, be, you better be ready. You better, you better be there. And... Let me, let me just say this, and I don't want to mince words about it. You better get your affairs in order. We're in the short rows now. We're on borrowed time. You may not have ever taken the opportunity to, to lead someone to Christ. And you might have lost friends and family members that are out there. And I hear people say it all the time. Well, if I, if I only knew that this would be the last time that I talked to them, I, I would have... I would have asked them about their relationship with the Lord. Well, you don't know. You don't know. I don't know. When you interact with people, you need to be having conversations with them about the Lord. Nobody cares about the, about the, the football game in eternity. Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about the, the race in eternity. Do they know the Lord or do they not? Because if they, if they don't know the Lord and you know the Lord and you don't tell them about the Lord, that's about the most hateful thing that you can do to somebody. We're on borrowed time and if you truly love them, you'll witness to them. We're not guaranteed our next breath. I'm going to go on in this chapter here just in case, uh, just in case somebody watching this later on that doesn't get raptured gets a chance to hear it. But in his estate shall he honor, verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now, if you're looking in your Bible, you're going to see, if, you're, if you've got a King James Bible, I didn't check the other ones on this, it, it, that God of forces, the God there is capitalized. Then you, have a, then you have a colon, and it says, And a, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. This is a rarity in the Bible, and this is a rarity in the English language, where the where God that's being referred to is is not God the Father, but they still capitalize it. So this is just how the English language works here. 
I'm not going to break this down into a total English lesson for us, but what's happened here at this point is the Antichrist has elevated himself above every God. Now he's the supreme God. Even though he's not, he's not above God the Father, he's masquerading as something that he's not. This capital G was appropriately placed. I struggled with that one for a while, and then I started looking over where they put a colon, and then they, they go on and they lowercase g him in the very, the very same verse here. So he's lifted up, and then he's torn down. So we, can, we, can see, we can see what's going on here. So as far as the, the worldly gods are concerned, they've appropriately done that here. I didn't check the other versions, but the King James has it, a capital G, and I was wondering, well, how in the world does that fit if we're talking about the Antichrist? Thus shall he do, verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with, with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps." But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. We, we get to hear how bad that Antichrist is. Nobody can stop him. Until verse 45 happens. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. Verse 45 tells us something about the Antichrist. But not only is his reign foretold, but his end is foretold. Now I want you to hear what I'm saying. Every one of you under the sound of my voice, my social media, maybe watching this later, you're coming to an end. Just like that Antichrist, you're coming to an end. The difference is you can have help or you can reject help. God wants to help you. So let Him. Let Him help you. He's, he's sent a helper. He's made a way where there was no way. You can trust on Jesus and Jesus will be your helper. Or you can reject Jesus and you can have no hope just like the Antichrist. Whatever you choose, Glory to God that you've got the free will to choose it. Ultimately, I hope you choose to accept Jesus and believe the gospel. But if you reject Him, thank God you had the choice and you weren't forced into it. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just not ready to, to accept Jesus. Well, you're rejecting Him then. It's not, a, it's not multiple choice. It's true or false. It's yes or no. There's not a third option out there. You either accept Him or you reject Him. You, if you're trying to delay accepting Him, let me tell you what, delayed obedience is disobedience. Just this morning, I had to get on my children for Brittany saying something to them, and then a few seconds later she had to say it again because they didn't do what she told her to do. And I busted the door like Cosmo Kramer on them. I, hey! I just hear your mama tell you to do something and then she have to tell you again. You better do what she tells you the first time. Stop being disobedient. Shut the door right back. Brittany probably thought I was going to go on for 30 minutes and make us late for church and all that. But I caught them. They, they didn't know I was right on the other side of that door listening. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Oh, I'll do it later is not getting it done. When that trumpet sounds, when this church is raptured, there's not going to be a later then. You fall over dead, have an aneurysm, 
choke on whatever Tim and Cindy's got cooked back there. There's not going to be time. So what will it be? Will it be everlasting life? Or will it be everlasting death? Will it be hope or no hope? Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names. God, we thank You today for the reading and the hearing of Your Word. Lord, we thank You for being able to trust this Word of Yours to be, to be true, Lord. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. Most importantly, we thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.